In the mid 80s, computer games were simple. You would load games from cassette or floppy disk onto your Commodore 64, Apple II or PC and have fun. The games themselves weren't large either, usually available on a few floppy disks. This meant that making copies of those games was easy enough. Blank floppy disks could be purchased from most retail stores pretty cheap and every computer at the time usually had a way to make copies of games. But in most cases, the games needed to be cracked first. Original games on floppy disk were sometimes mastered with non-standard sectors, or perhaps there would be a manual copy protection check that required you to own an original copy of the game with its user manual so you could enter the code that the game was asking of you. In North America, the IBM PC was fast becoming the dominant home computer and by the late 80s, hard drives were becoming a standard. While games that you would purchase from the store would still be shipped on floppy disks, owning a hard drive meant that you could completely install the game and play it without the need of the floppy disks. But this approach to installing games onto a hard disk would raise concerns about software piracy. In order to mitigate this, software publishers would usually resort to adding manual protection in their games. My first recollection of manual-based copy protection would be the gold-boxed Advanced Dungeons & Dragons games. Champions of Kryn on the Amiga was one such game. When the game would load, manual protection simply works by prompting you to locate the word from the manual. With a quick lookup of the manual, you would find the word, enter it, and then be able to play the game. You would not be asked to enter a new code again for that play session, but if you restarted the game, you would be prompted to enter a new code. Manual based protection stopped casual copying of discs, and it was well and truly before most of us had scanners, but nothing would stop you from taking your manual to the local library and photocopying all the pages, giving that out to your friends and effectively defeating the protection. It's easy to see why that the manual-based copy protection wasn't really cutting it though. Publishers then tried to add manuals or codes in dark colored paper or dark text in an attempt to mitigate photocopying, but this could still be circumvented. Over on the Commodore Amiga, hard drives were too becoming a standard and allowed for more games to be installed, especially as the number of discs required to play some games increased significantly and it faced the same problems as the IBM PC. Software publishers tried to come up with new and sophisticated methods to defeat software piracy. The manual based copy protection wasn't really cutting it anymore. But software publishers would soon introduce a new variation of the manual based copy protection and that would be known as the code wheel. The code wheel has origins dating back to 1470 when Italian architect Leon Battista Alberti would create a decoder wheel which he would use to encode messages. And in more recent times, Alan Turing, a British cryptologist, helped crack the Enigma code leading to the end of World War II. A code wheel is a simple device that contains two circles. It could then be used to encode or decode messages. Usually, the outer ring would contain the plain alphabet, and the inner ring would contain a scrambled alphabet known as the cipher. The cipher alphabet is usually the plain alphabet rotated left or right by some number of positions. And with a simple translation, it was possible to encode messages. But code wheels in video games work a little differently. They don't actually contain a cipher in the sense that they're used to decode hidden messages. Think of them more as a translation wheel. A game will prompt you with a code and then you use the code wheel to line up the rings that correspond to that code and then enter the value that's in the middle or cutout portion. My first experience with a code wheel was on the Amiga with the game FA18 Interceptor from Electronic Arts. Released in 1988, it's an iconic jet fighter simulator that allows you to embark on 10 missions. The game ran fast on a stock Amiga 500 and it's an amazing piece of programming. The original North American version of the game came on a single disc and it had a code wheel hidden in its gatefold sleeve. The game would prompt you to enter a value from a four character code. If the code was for example 2213, you would line up the outer ring with the number two, the middle ring with the number two, and the inner ring with the number one. And then by looking at the contents of what's inside number three, that would be the code that you would enter. In this example, the answer would be 136625. 
The problem with this code wheel, however, is that it's not really any more advanced than the manual based copy protection. While it is cool to get a code wheel inside the game packaging, ultimately this code wheel can be taken apart and photocopied individually and then reconstructed. And if you weren't up to the task of taking apart your code wheel, you could simply build an Excel spreadsheet of all the possible combinations. Sure, this may take you a while, but it was certainly an option. Just like manual based copy protection, game publishers became a little more creative. The game Falcon by Spectrum Holobyte that released for the Commodore Amiga, IBM PC and Atari ST also would contain a code wheel. This only had two rings, however, but as you can see, it contained symbols instead of letters and those symbols would be light blue on a white background, making it more difficult for both photocopying or replicating on an Excel spreadsheet. The advanced Dungeons & Dragons Goldbox games would also begin migrating towards code wheels. This would utilize a two-ring code wheel that would have symbols instead of letters and numbers, but unfortunately they would be quite easy to photocopy. And curiously enough, my copy of Hillsfar for the Commodore 64, for whatever reason, would come included with not one, but three individual code wheels. This meant that you could make two copies of the game and hand it out to your friends with a copy of the code wheel each. It also meant an easier decision to take apart a code wheel and photocopy one. There was also a long-standing rumor that the game Paul Radiance would use the exact same code wheel as Hillsfar, so I decided to try it out myself. I downloaded an uncracked copy of Paul Radiance and installed it on my Commodore Amiga. And surely enough, with my trusty Hillsfar code wheel, I was able to get past the copy protection check. Software publishers were well aware that code wheels weren't foolproof and to mitigate the ongoing piracy, they decided to get more creative. And they would do this by replacing letters and numbers with symbols. The game Another World released in 1991 as Out of This World in the United States is a cinematic platformer that was developed by Eric Chahi. Rather than asking the user to enter in a keyword or phrase, it incorporated symbols. The symbols themselves were not fixed width, and the inner window selection was not standard, which meant that trying to photocopy this code wheel and then trying to use an X-Acto knife to cut out the exact pieces of the symbols would be a lot more difficult, but certainly not impossible. This was also compounded by the fact that the symbols were not fixed width. But even with these advancements, code wheels were a pain and copy protection checks were always annoying. So when LucasArts released The Secret of Monkey Island, their code wheel was called Dial a Pirate. This would have you match up the face with what was displayed on the screen and then enter in the date. For The Secret of Monkey Island 2, they would use a similar code wheel, but this one was called Mix and Mojo, which would ask the user to complete the voodoo recipe by entering the proportions of the ingredients. With symbol-based code wheels slowly becoming more standard, it meant that the original owners would be less inclined to take theirs apart for photocopying. But for the cracking groups, code wheel-based protection would be trivial to break. Now, of course, nothing beats the simplicity of just completely bypassing the protection or cracking the copy protection itself. So let's go ahead and take a look at pools of radiance on the Amiga. We're gonna fire up an emulator and an action replay cartridge and attempt to crack code wheel protection ourselves. Now the most effective way to defeat a code wheel protection other than photocopying the code wheel itself is to just crack the protection. And we're going to go ahead and crack the code wheel protection of Pool of Radiance for the Commodore Amiga. Now just to kind of show you what's going on here, this is the Pool of Radiance copy protection and we did see earlier that a Hillsfar code wheel would actually work on this game. But let's assume that you didn't have access to the code wheel back in the day and you were sitting at this screen and you would normally have three attempts to uh, type in a, a code. So let's just uh, try three attempts here. And uh, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna basically make the copy protection fail. And after the third attempt, it will kick you out back to the, you know, just the, the DOS prompt, right? So, so let's go ahead and figure out how can we crack this protection now. Let's go ahead and enter a, a word in MVG123, but we're not going to press enter here. We're going to uh, break into our action replay. And on WinUAE, all I need to do is press page up and you can see we're in our action replay. So from here, what we can do now is we can search 
for that string that we just typed in. So let's search for MVG123 and um, it's going to basically just search the memory for that particular string and it should hopefully find a match. And now what we want to do is find all the occurrences in the code where it's actually being referenced. So we use the FA command to do that. So as you can see, it's still going through memory right now, but it's already brought back two results, 56C10 and 56C52. Now, what we want to do is put a breakpoint on 56C52. And we've got a breakpoint there. Now, just to um, show you, to illustrate what's going on here. So we've got, um, if we type in M, uh, 5A5C5, that's basically showing us what's in memory. And as you can see, we've got MVG123 in our memory blocks. So essentially what we're doing at 56C52 is we're just basically pointing to that address in memory, loading that effective address location into our address register. So what do we do now? Well, what we can do now is we've, we've set a breakpoint at that particular line so if we go back now and enter press enter at this point it should actually hit our breakpoint with any luck and as you can see it's hit our breakpoint at 56c52 so what can we do here well a couple of things that we can take a look at but what i'm going to do is i'm going to step through the the code one line at a time so there is a tr command or a trace command and you can see here it's moving A0, the, uh, the address of A0 into D0. So if we continue moving, stepping through this code, eventually we should come across something that is bringing in the actual correct code itself from the, the list of uh, valid words that the code rule is expecting. And let's continue to step through this. Now that particular line there looks a little interesting to me because it's loading the effective address of another address into A0. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what's in 5AC4C. And you can see it's got the text beware. Now, is that the actual code? I'm not sure. Um, if we continue to step through memory, you can see that there are all these strings in there and these are most likely the kind of the meta, you know, the entire list of, of code wheel responses that has been loaded into the game. If we go back and take a look at the code wheel, you can see how the words in the memory location match up with the code wheel. So we are most definitely on the right path here. So it may not necessarily be beware. That could be just that could just be the first one in the the list. So there may be an offset to another code. We're not really too sure what that might be. So let's continue to uh, step through this code. And you can see here it's adding D1 to A0. So it's like it's it's basically pointing to a different offset, but. I don't know if that's necessarily that interesting to us because ultimately what we want to look for here is something that's doing a comparison uh, or a test, for example. And this particular line here looks interesting to me, this BNE 5A3A6. Now, this is basically, if we basically look at the disassembly here, let's basically get a, a larger look at what's going on here. So let's do a disassembly of 5A3, we'll say uh, 50, and let's just kind of step through this until we get to 7E. So that's the that's the line that we're in right there. Now, as you can see on 5A366, we're loading in that that list of codes that the code wheel has in its memory. And then it's adding the contents of D1 to A0. So that's like it's pointing to the actual code that is the correct one. And there's a couple of other commands and then it's doing a test of D0 and then it's doing a break if not equal to 5A3A6. So just for giggles, what if we 
change the line 5A37E and we basically say NOP. In other words, it's no instruction, we just NOP it out. What will that do for us? Well, before we proceed, let's go ahead and take a look at our disassembly again just to make sure that that actually, that command actually was applied. As you can see, our, our command is now a NOP at 5A37E. So let's see what happens when we jump back out. And as you can see, it looks like, it looks like we have gotten past the protection. And as you can see, we've cracked pulls a radiance. By simply replacing the string comparison branch, if not equal instruction to always continue, we are able to proceed past the check and onto the game. Very simple. I should add that because it's text-based, cracking this game was quite trivial. It took me maybe about an hour, and to the experienced cracker, they could probably handle it in a matter of minutes. Symbol-based code wheels, like the one in Another World, for example, would require a much more sophisticated crack. I think looking back at code wheel protection, it was actually quite a lot of fun. When you would buy a big box PC game or an Amiga game, you would get a lot in the packaging and it was part of the fun of getting all these like little goodies and stuff in your big box and getting a code wheel was just it was kind of cool because you knew that you were getting a legitimate copy of the game it wasn't a pirate copy or anything like that or wasn't a bootleg copy of the game and it was just part of the entire package and it kind of made it fun so ultimately code wheels kind of just became obsolete and out of date when CD-ROM games started to appear. With CD-based games, there were different protection measures that were incorporated as part of the CD that were a lot more sophisticated than just a piece of paper and a bunch of codes on it. But guys, I'm going to leave it here for this episode. It was great to revisit Code World Protection with you guys. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. If you liked it, leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.